Alright, what's up everyone? Welcome back to Structure Free Learning. And in this video, we're going to do our first video on beams and mechanics and materials. And I'll describe what a beam is, and then explain the importance of internal shear and moment diagrams. And then we'll talk about a process for determining the internal shear and moment functions. So the first thing we want to do is describe, or at least define for us, what a beam is. Many of you, if asked what is a beam, would probably say, oh, it's something that is horizontal it bends and it's flexible or I think the way that we would interpret that flexibility as being slender and long now generally speaking you'd probably be correct if you went ahead with those three definitions but you know we want to do something maybe a little bit more and just like people beams want to be defined by what's going on on the inside the content of a person and their character and a beam is a beam if the member on the inside I have an internal moment and a shear and for us if we have flexure and shear this is how we typically define what a beam is and the axial force that's happening here we say is negligible we have internal moment and internal shear present and that is what we're gonna call a beam and it doesn't matter if it's horizontal or not and here are some different types of beams that you may have seen before in statics. So for instance, you could have a beam with one end fixed, and this is called a cantilever beam. You are probably also familiar with a simply supported beam, which means that on its ends, one end is pinned and the other has a roller support. And another type of beam we're probably going to deal with in this class or in this topic of mechanics of materials. And it looks like what is to be a simply supported beam. This beam has this portion that's hanging over the roller support. We'll call that an overhang. And this is an overhang beam or has an overhang on it. There are other types of beams and names that you can have, but you know, it really doesn't matter. All that matters is what's the loading doing. The loading is typically transverse to the beam so that it's causing bending. And transverse loading would be something like here, like a distributed load like this, a point load like this, or a concentrated moment, or a linearly distributed load. Bam. These are all examples of transverse loading that causes bending. Other types of beams are like a, a fixed fixed beam or a continuous beam, which means it's like a really long beam that just continues. And this is kind of a model for a bridge structure or a floor beam in a building. And a fixed fixed beam and a continuous beam, you don't normally study in a first course in mechanics and materials because they are statically indeterminate to more than one degree and so it requires some additional techniques and you probably would encounter this in more like of a, your first structural analysis course or something but it's out there they're used to model a lot of structural systems that we use and that we design now one of the big things that we really want to be able to do is to come up with internal shear and moment diagrams or functions to describe what the internal shear and moment are at any location along the length of a beam knowing the internal shear and moment functions or being able to see the shear and moment diagrams helps us to locate the maximum internal shear and maximum moment along the length of a beam. And if we have that information, that means that we could calculate the maximum stresses, the maximum normal stress, the maximum shear stress. If we can determine maximum stresses, then we can design our beams for whatever condition may occur using the basic design relationships and knowing the material that we've chosen for the beams. And being able to do this is, in a nutshell, this is like what we've always been doing, taking an internal normal force or shear or moment or torsion, locating where it's maximum, calculating the stresses associated with it, and using the basic design relationship to either design something, and when I say design, I mean like selecting geometry, not selecting material and quality quantity of material so we're economical or checking design and when I say checking design I mean like does it work the way it is what is the maximum load that we can apply to it 
and we're not there yet, but once we determine the internal shear moment functions, we can also determine what is called the curvature of a beam. And with that, we can use a bunch of different techniques to calculate the flexion. And this curvature is based on the moment diagram. And we use that knowledge or this approximation of the curvature and its relation to the moment diagram to calculate deflections. And deflection calculations are super important also because they, you know, you don't want a beam that's all sagging, right? You know, it's just, it just ain't right. It, it may be strong enough, but shoot, every time you walk in it, if it dips two, three, four inches, you're going to be like, what? What's up with that? The people who use your structure aren't going to feel safe. And if you look up and your second floor is sagging, you're going to be like, oh man, I'm going to get out. And doing all this, you know, coming up with design, checking design, calculating deflections of beams, all of that starts all the way back here with internal shear and moment diagrams or functions. And all of that, those shear and moment functions or shear and moment diagrams are all rooted in statics. And all right, so let's focus on internal shear and moment functions now. And what these internal shear and moment functions are, are just mathematical equations or relationships that describe the internal shear along the length of a beam or the internal moment along the length of a beam. So before I get into my approach, let's consider a, some beam with a bunch of loading on it. Now take a beam here with, that has some overhang. And what I want to do is be able to describe the internal shear at any point along the length of this beam as well as the internal moment at any point along the length of this beam. And so my approach to doing this and the approach I would like to take is like this. The first thing I want to do is identify the discontinuities and you may be wondering what the heck is a discontinuity. A discontinuity is something that changes the internal shear and moment function. It makes you transition. It's discontinuous. Our discontinuities, the way we're going to define those discontinuity will be at a beginning or end of a distributed load at concentrated forces or moments and at support reactions because really support reactions are also concentrated forces or moments and at changes in cross-section geometry and usually these are sudden changes that we're going to be looking for so in this little example problem our discontinuities are here one the beginning of this distributed load, so this point right here, this support here, and this location is a discontinuity because it also has the end of a distributed load as well as a support reaction. This location because of the concentrated moment and this here because of the concentrated force. So I have identified one, two, three, four, five discontinuities. And the next thing I wanna do in my approach is identify or at least cut between discontinuity. So what I like to do is take another line, say I'm going to cut here, I'm going to cut here, I'm going to cut here and here. So I have five discontinuities. I'm going to need to make four cuts in this case. In general, the number of cuts is the number of discontinuities minus one. For each cut, I'm going to establish a coordinate system, which means that each cut location has its own origin and direction. And I can't emphasize this enough. This is so important and so overlooked. Right? And so the way I'm going to demonstrate this is on this beam here. And so I'm going to call this cut one. For cut one, I'm going to choose an origin. A good place for an origin is a discontinuity location. For cut one, I'm going to choose my origin at this pin support. Boom, that's going to be my origin for cut one. And my coordinate system is going to be defined from here going to the right. Boom, and I'm going to call this X1. And this range for X1 will be from discontinuity to discontinuity. And any function that I create using X1 only applies between discontinuity to discontinuity. Here is cut two. I can choose an origin for cut two. I could, I could choose this location, this discontinuity as my origin for cut two or I can choose the same location as an origin. There's nothing that says I can't choose this location again, but I'm gonna choose here, boom, like this. I'm gonna choose the same origin location, and boom, here's my cut two, and I'm gonna call this coordinate X2. And this coordinate X2 only applies from this discontinuity to this discontinuity, from the beginning of the distributed load to this roller support here. For the cut here, I'm gonna call this cut three. I'm gonna say, oh, my origin for this coordinate system is here at the roller support. And I'm gonna go to this cut right here, and I'm gonna call this coordinate X3. 
three. And any functions, any shear and moment functions for x3 apply from the roller support to the concentrated moment, from discontinuity to discontinuity. Am I overemphasizing this? This is super duper important, man. It's crazy. And then here for cut four, you know, I'm going to get all crazy. And I'm going to choose my origin over here. And I'm going to say, I'm going to go right to left for the direction. And boom, this would be X4 for my coordinate system. If you can do this, you are like 50, 60% of the way there because the stuff that's left is just statics. And here, it just means that you, you will need to make the cut. Choose either everything on the left or everything on the right of the cut. Draw that FBD. Bust the equilibrium equations to get the shear and moment functions. All right, hopefully that gives you a good introduction into how and why we have shear and moment functions and diagrams. And then hopefully you've got a sense for the approach of how to determine shear and moment functions. Take it easy. Let me know if you have any questions. Structure free.